Hello. Oh, here we go. Hi, my name is Astrid Bailey, and today I'm going to talk to you about how we build stronger relationships between security and our product teams at Adobe. First, a little bit about me. I'm, I've had every title from project manager, program manager, product owner, um, and everything in between. Um, but I've been in cybersecurity kind of off and on for the last 10 years. I also have dabbled in event technology. So this is really fun for me to bring my event world and my cybersecurity worlds back together. So today's learning objectives, we're going to talk about how we get things positioned more strategically in roadmaps, how we use some automation and standardization to make that easier, um, how we work with management and executive teams to make better decisions, and then how to improve the overall relationships between our security leaders and then our, our leaders throughout the rest of the organization. So first of all, what is a security partner? So at Adobe, we created this role to really indicate that we don't want to you know, play whack-a-mole with security anymore, and we don't want to say, hey, we're security, we're so important, you're going to do what we say. We really want to have that friendship and that relationship with our product teams. So we chose the name partner to really indicate um, that we don't want to be the bully anymore. We want to be that partner relationship. Um, so this is kind of the mission statement for the team that I run. So the way to look at it is I'm a program manager but we have a whole team of security partners, and then I just help with make that process look easier so that we work standard across the organization. Adobe, as you might imagine, has a pretty large security organization. So here's three of our pillars. We actually have a fourth one, which was Tech GRC. Um, but we're the security partners. We basically the goal is that we're that one voice, and so. Instead, it still happens, unfortunately, but instead of security you know, reaching out to every product team so they feel overwhelmed and they're always getting um, barraged by different people, we try to have like a one-to-one -one relationship between the security partner and the security champion, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so what do security partners do? So when you first hear about a security partner, you might think, oh, it's a project manager, it's a program manager. And that's really doing a disservice to their skill set. And this is coming from a program manager, so I'm not saying that that's not a valid role. I'm embedding my career on the fact that that's a valid role. But these are um, more technical people. Oftentimes, they're an engineer who was like, hey, I'd like to get into management, and this is our path to that. So first, we, you know, we say, let's bucket up that technical expertise. Let's give you an opportunity to act more like a manager and then if you like it, great. Like You can move on to maybe managing people who do this. And if you don't like it, you can go back to being an engineer. Um, this is what I would say is kind of our, our flow of what we do. So the security partner program um, meets with the security champions, who I'll talk about in a second. In the industry, we have security champions. And that has such a wide range of definitions, but for now, Let's say that a security champion is somebody who's on the product team, who maybe doesn't work in security all the time, but they're interested. Maybe they want a career in security, but they're not sure. So we have these volunteer or voluntold positions where they step up and say, you know, I'll help with security, but I don't have to be fully in security. So there are liaison. And the, um, they meet biweekly or monthly or ad hoc, depending on how big that team is. And we kind of iterate with them with what we call active management. So active management, the output of this is that we do clear focus points for solutions. There's transparency on all levels of management. So we really help with reporting. And then we integrate security work into roadmaps. Um, how, so how do we provide those services? Beyond what we've discussed so far, here's our three main, we call them our pillars. So we've got active management, prioritization, and communication. We spend the majority of our time on the active management. Generally, about 60% of our time is focused on really helping our teams actively, not just saying, here, do the work, but how do we have those conversations? How do we um, take a teaching mentality as well? And then, for example, like if a, say, leadership comes out with this big security initiative, it's super important and you have to do it. Well, we don't want to take that top-down approach. We really want to look at the backlog of all the security things for that um, team and say, 
here's where the trade-offs are and help have those conversations. And then we can go back to our security leadership and say, hey, this product team, they can't do this right now. They've got these other priorities you've already asked them to do. Or we can deprioritize you know, previous work and say, actually, based on the industry, this is the most important work for today. So who do security partners work with? So here's um, the key players that we work with. And I really want to focus on the left side of the slide, so the security partner and the security champion. And when I start talking really fast, sometimes it's hard to distinguish the two roles. But essentially, we've got the security partner, who I've already talked about a lot, and, um, who's my team, and then the security champion who's out in the, in the field or in the product teams. Um, and we do all kinds of things. We try to be creative, too. So the security champion's kind of that ground level. They're often a manager or a senior manager, but we work all the way up through the VPs. And so sometimes we have conversations about, you know, why isn't this moving? Well, I don't have enough resources, and I'm really strapped. Okay, well, can we get our, our VPs together? Can we get our VP or our, even our CSO, can we get them to meet with your team and really stress the emphasis, how important this work is or what the trade-offs are to the business? or even what sales deals are being held up, and then we can have those conversations all the way up and down that chain, which has been super useful. Um, the other thing that we have really noticed about the security champions is that they are our friends and they are our allies, and the more effective that they are, the more likely they are to stay, and then the more effective they become. And so we did a survey uh, last year and learned that if somebody is a security champion for five years, they often give us like 16 hours a week or more, but the newbies give us, you know, two to five. But as they grow in their understanding, they become more effective and they often get more engaged in those conversations, which is really rewarding. And then sometimes, if we're lucky, they actually say, we love security so much, can you get, help me get a job over here? And then we're happy to hire them because they bring that product perspective. This is another way to look at the swirl that is a large organization. And so you see that the security champion and the security partner are kind of like the hub in the middle of all these spokes. And, and another way to think about this is that we don't have the bandwidth to um, maintain all the relationships we need in the organization to do security work. And so by having the security partner kind of be central to the security organization and having the security champion be central to the product organization, as we reorg our teams or as new leaders are hired or as relationships are developed, we're able to just leverage that person. So part of being a security champion is really understanding the org and being in deep with everyone. Um, the other aspect here is truly just to call out the collaboration um, between the two. This is a really healthy relationship, or it can be. And then we also try to give back. And so we offer training. Um, last quarter, I introduced what I called the Rockstar Awards. So our, our top security champions were honored in a meeting. And then um, our CSO actually emailed them to thank them and their whole management chain up through VP, which was really rewarding to see um, them get impacted. And then their managers emailed us back and said, oh my gosh, thank you. I'm going to put this as a part of their check-in. And I'm gonna, this will be a part of their next promotion. And so just really trying to. Um, Look for the simple ways to thank our champions and make it a really rewarding program to be a part of. Um, so one of the things that we do, we, um, we also do risk assessment. So we have all kinds of inputs of um, different, you know, we've got different tools that tell us where our vulnerabilities are. We have different um, initiatives that come through. And so as you see, the, the whole point of the security partners is to help wade through that soup for our teams and then do some analysis and keep those conversations going so that we end up with roadmaps, get well plans, which I'll talk about later. Um, we help with escalations to leadership and then obviously extensions and um, approvals. So now that I've set the foundation for exactly what we do, um, I'll go through our learning objectives. So the first one is how we get position, um, asks position more strategically on roadmaps. So Adobe has probably 200 product teams and services or more. I usually just use a general number because it changes all the time. But we have 14 security partners. So we can't do a one-to-one. -one. Um, and so this is one of the ways that we look at the teams who need the most attention would be by uh, visibility and risk. So 
you know, our bigger products that Adobe is known for, say Photoshop, for example, like if that got popped, it would really Im um, impact our reputation versus our internal teams. You know, they may or may not be exploitable, at least on, on the um, outside. And so we don't need to spend as much time with them. So we rank them based on this. Um, and then we move them into what we call our, our tiers or our support models. So full support, these are our big beefy applications. They need a lot of attention. They meet with a security partner every two weeks, sometimes more, if they're you know, trending yellow or red. And then our lower teams, like I mentioned, who don't need that day-to-day handholding, we can often manage them with Slack or just the occasional email or conversation. So then each security partner gets a mix of teams, so they get some some big ones or some problem children, and then they get like some easier ones so that they, they generally have between maybe three and eight teams uh, to manage. And then those teams, if there are, some of our acquisition uh, products, for example, have tons and tons of teams, well, they may boil up into, um, they may have a super champion or they may have multiple champions feeding into the same meeting. Um, so this is how, um, this is an example of our roadmap. So that bottom box there, instead of showing our security roadmaps, because we all know that would be bad, um, he, this is kind of just what they look like. So we, we work through, we bucket the work. We do work with other security teams within Adobe. So whether it's compliance, whether it's something that our red team has found, whether it's um, like tooling to build out those roadmaps. So the, the prioritization part is a, is a collaboration, but then we really try not to be ticket pushers. So they do come out in JIRA tickets, but we try to be thoughtful and strategic on how we schedule these things out. Say we have a team that is, you know, we've given them a roadmap, but that's a little bit overwhelming. They're actually, we would categorize them as a, a, at a yellow risk or even red. Instead of, you know, saying, well, just do the roadmap, we do what we call a path to yellow or a path to green. So we put their roadmap aside for a second and we come up with a shorter, more strategic roadmap to really show them how to get back to that risk rating, the more positive risk rating, whether it's yellow or green, and make it uh, bite-sized. And then if, it, if they need it, we will meet with their uh, VPs once a week or more just to make sure that they're getting that emphasis and they're getting those resources. So in the past, we've able, been able to help teams you know, up their head count if they just were slipping behind. Um, so number two here, automation and standardization. This is what we call the reporting funnel because as I mentioned before, we make sure to have relationships across the organization. So you see the security champion, they get tons of detail. They're up at the top. But as you go down the organization, they might get less detail, but they're still getting the same message. And we're, it's really important to us that they're getting the same message all the way through the organization. Previously, we, you know, we'd have great conversations at the executive team level, and we have great conversations at the security champion level. And then the, that middle layer was like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And so we really um, have introduced and are working to refine all levels of dashboarding and reporting so that everybody gets that same message. One of the ways that we do that is we, we have dashboards, but we email them out once a month to our teams, and we give them a week, and then we send their VP report. So we send them, here's what you look like now, work with us, let's improve this before we send out the VP report. And that's been really helpful in building our relationship and that trust, because we're not telling on them, we'd rather that they were doing well, but you know, if you don't do what we're asking, then we are gonna continue to have that conversation. This is an example of what our dashboards look like, at least a mock-up version, and, it, and this is what's emailed out as a report. Um, so then you see here, that's a typo, so you can ignore the learning objective one. We're not back there. Um, but we, we show the risk status, we do the dashboards, we have actionable plans and focus points. We have other little automations to help with that, like Slack notifications or emails when critical vulns are opened, that kind of thing. Um, so moving on to learning objective three, this is how we help executive teams make better decisions. So as we just discussed, getting leadership buy-in is super important. And another way we do this is through our VP meetings. We're kind of revising what this looks like. Adobe got a new CSO 
four or five months ago, and so we're, we're building this out again, but we're having VP meetings. And then what we've learned with VPs is dashboards are great and they're helpful. We have one dashboard, for example, we send out that compares them against their peers, so which VPs really don't like to see that they're not doing as well as their peers. That's been very effective. But one of the other ways that we do it is through stories. Um, for example, one of the teams that's kind of my sister team is our sales engagement, so they answer all those questionnaires for customers. Um, and when we're having issues with certain VPs or we're just meeting with them in general, and maybe they're not doing their pen test findings or they're not remediating, the best thing to come to them is say, like, oh, well, you know, if you would do these, we could unlock like $10 million or $100 million or, you know, you're really holding us up because they really hate being the cog that's holding up revenue. And then uh, we've also earned a lot of respect from our security partner program. And so unlike more of a hierarchical situation, like our security partners come to those meetings, they're able to talk to the VPs directly, which has been um, really great relationship building and speaks to the fact that we are learning how to communicate with VPs in the way that they most appreciate. Um, uh, so over and over we found that they get excited about metrics that impact customers and we educate them on how that security hygiene, um, so instead of just like here's what the product impact is, really shifting that conversation to customer impact, whether it's investments needed um, or metrics and then Adobe Security actually now rolls into what we call the trust organization. And so we are actually paired up with legal. And so we are also reframing those conversations to be more about how do we instill trust in our customers. So yes, security is what we can get behind, especially being in security. But you know, you go to a product team and they're like, OK, that's great, but I have all these other features that are going to make me money. And so how do we bring that back together and say, no, we're not just asking you to do security things because we're passionate. We're asking you to do security things because we want to be a trusted organization and we want to continue to grow the faith that our customers put in us. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this brief overview of our program so far, but for our final objective, I'm going to talk about how to improve overall relationships between our security leaders and our product team leaders. So we are constantly iterating this program, um, and we're, especially as we've gone through a couple of reorgs at at Adobe, um, it always brings room for new opportunity as new leaders come to the fold with different opinions. And so well, we, all, we get a lot of questions like, are you still going to be a security partner program? Are you still going to provide that same level of service? And the answer is yes, but it's also no, because we don't want to stay here. We want to continue to grow. We want to make it a more efficient, better program for everyone. So one of the things that's really important to me in particular in my role is that I am really working on how do we add those feedback models? How do we do better surveys? I have to take some classes on you know, data analysis. Like how do we get those good insights? And how do we make sure that you know, I'm very proud of our program, but I need that product perspective as well. Like I want them to come to us and tell us if it is or isn't working because I'm just, you know, I'm not close enough to their day to day. And so we're doing surveys amongst our leaders. We're doing surveys amongst the internal teams that we work with. We're doing surveys amongst even just our team. Like, what's it like to be on this team? Because we really want that feedback. And then over time, I'm tracking those results too so we can have a great satisfaction score. And so lastly, I want to talk about two major efforts that we're undertaking this year to make the product team's lives easier. And the first is a biweekly initiatives meeting. So as I said before, we've got like four pillars of security, leaders all trying to funnel into our program, sometimes around our program, we're trying to get them through our program, but that means that initiatives are changing a lot more frequently. And so I lead a bi-weekly meeting where I bring together um, our two directors and two VPs, so basically our CSOs directs, and we go through you know, what work they're asking of the product teams, what's come through, what resources it would need, and then hopefully prioritize those and ideally maintain consistency on priority. So they're not changing all the time unless it's really important and making those leaders um, work it out amongst their peers what exactly the priorities are at the company. And the second one, which I'm most excited about, is what we call our, um, our CAB, or Customer Advisory Board. Not to be confused with the Change Advisory Board. I spent a very long time in a meeting with somebody until right at the end they go, well, you are the Change Advisory Board, right? Like, I am not. I've been telling you forever, I am not your channel. But the customer advisory board, so we have our champions, and they do give us feedback. 
but we reached out to some of our best and brightest champions or um, in different areas of the organization and said, would you be a part of, it, what, of our customer advisory board? We're going through a lot of changes in the organization and we could go all the way up through your layers of management and all the way down, but that'll just waste everybody's time. Would you be willing to meet with our security leaders every other month for an hour and a half? And the promise to you is that the things that you bring up, the issues that you bring up, we will work to resolve. And so what we've done is I've led, I think, four or five of them. At first, it was just my team picking the brains of our security champions. But once our, our two VPs and our two directors got, a, got wind of what was going on, they actually asked to be invited as well. So we're, we're iterating on this. I don't think it's quite perfect. I need to add a few more people going forward. But I'm really excited about our CAB program because it is breaking down those silos, which as you can imagine, are quite common at a big company like Adobe. Um, so in conclusion, I wanted to thank you for spending time with me today. Um, and I've enjoyed pulling together lessons learned from leading our security partner program. To wrap up, we talked about what exactly a security partner is, where we fit in the organization, what we do on a daily basis, and who we work with. I went into further examples and details to illustrate our learning objectives. For learning objective one, how to get security asks positioned more strategically on product roadmaps. I talked about how we measured visibility and the risk of product team to determine how to best support that team, as well as our best practices about around creating quarterly roadmaps, including paths to yellow and paths to green. For learning objective two, how to make use of automation and standardization, I emphasized the importance of consistent communications, including our reporting funnel, dashboard mockup, and some of the ways we've addressed the gaps in our technical constraints. For learning objective three, how to ensure that management and executive teams make better security decisions. Um, I talked about how the success we found with our VP meetings so far and how we're trying to communicate that right story to executives and help illustrate the impact of completing this work with our customer relationships. And finally, I talked about um, how to improve relationships at the highest levels of our organization and how we, in the future of our security partner program. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I'm just curious how you identify um, security champions within your organization and how you keep them engaged in these conversations. So I know you mentioned a little bit about that, but sure. specifically around how you identify those in these different teams. So I would say um, we know who the leaders are in the product organization, so we often go to them and say, hey, we need a security champion. Is there anyone who's interested? And ideally, someone is interested in the role. Sometimes somebody gets volunteered, but we look first for that interest level, and then the ways that we keep them involved. To be honest, in COVID, we kind of had, we stalled out on some of like the live events and things that we did. So I'm working on bringing that back. So I'm doing like a program-wide meeting once so we've got two, about 240 champions. So I'm doing a program-wide meeting once a quarter where we call out the rock stars and we give them awards and a lot of recognition in front of their peers. Well, we do training events. Um, we, in the past, every other year, they did a security champion summit. So I'm gonna try to bring that back, at least hybrid. And then I just sent them all a big thank you gift. So a jacket that says security champions on it. And I'm looking for ways to try to make it go both ways. And then we've also made it clear to our champions when it come, comes time for your annual review, like let us know and we'd be happy to write your uh, manager a love note that you can include in your review to hopefully get promoted, things like that. Thank you, I had the same question, but I, I'll follow it up. Um, how do you describe the role of your security champions? Like when you are introducing that and offering that or describing it as an option, how are you describing it? And then follow, follow up, when you identify the rock stars, what do you mean by rock stars? Sure. Um, so we describe the role as like, are you interested in security when we start there? Generally, we're looking for somebody who's involved in sprint planning so that they can help pull in different security asks. But we also ask, you know, are you interested in leadership? Because this is a good leadership opportunity because you won't just be on your team. You'll be reaching out to everyone else. And then for the rock star awards, because there's 240 champions and I have six, 15 security partners, I really couldn't, who don't, because they work one-to-one, -one, I couldn't have them vote on who, you know, who's the greatest of all time. So I just told each security partner, hey, I know you work really hard with these teams. Pick out somebody you work hard with and like, and get, send me some bullets on why they're amazing. 
And every single one of them said, I can't choose, they're all great. And I said, great, we'll do it every quarter, but this quarter, who's your favorite? <laughs> all right, um, one last plug for the day. I'll be out of here. We're doing a student networking room in room 229 upstairs starting at 11. And many of you probably met me in check-in and I gave you a blue wristband because you're willing to talk to students. This is just another avenue where you can come and chat with students. We've also got post-its so that you can put on the wall and answer questions. So if you don't want to talk but you just want to answer questions, we can do that as well. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.